Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all today? <clears throat> all right. Well, sorry to uh, the House of Bear for showing up a little bit late. And incidentally, for any of you playing the game, uh, my loyalties are for sale. I do work for a vendor, so um, I'm more than willing to jump into your house, depending on what, you know, what the offer is. So I am really honored for the opportunity to be able to come here and speak today. Uh, and this is material I've never presented be before, so I will make mistakes, but that's okay. Um, the whole premise of this clown on fire came from something a friend of mine, Chris, said to me. He said, there's nothing sadder than a clown on, <coughs> a clown on fire. And I thought, at first I laughed, and I thought, oh, okay, that, that's kind of amusing. And then I went, wait a minute. This actually has a little bit more deeper meaning the more I chew on it. It had a little bit more gravity. And the longer I thought about it, I realized that there are a lot of parallels with security and the way we tell our collective story. We need to do a better job of telling our story beyond the confines of the security community. Within the security community, we do a very good job of this. But before we get into that, let me talk about turning on my clicker. Let me talk about who am I? Why am I standing up in front of you? And uh, why is Smoozer giving me a hard time for taking too long to get started? <laughs> My name is Dave Lewis, and before I moved into the vendor space, which I've been in for about three years, I spent about 20 years as a defender, uh, as well as doing pen testing. So I've done everything from being an acting firewall admin, sorry, a firewall admin to an acting CISO. I have more scar tissue than I care to admit. And along the lines, before I even got into security, I used to work for a place called MCA Records. And I had a mentor there who did me a great service. He told me that whenever you are going into a meetings, whenever you start your day, wherever you happen to go in your business day, carry a notebook with you. Write down everything you need to remember. Write down everything that happens. Write down anything thought that comes to your mind. After having done this for roughly 20 years, once I got into security, I had a stack of manuals about this high. And as I went through them, I find that there's all kinds of stories. And one of the really interesting things that really struck me is the recurring, oh God, we did this again two years later. Oh, we did the same thing again. We keep doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different result. What was the definition of insanity again? So as a result of all of this material that I've collected over the last couple of decades, it gave me the opportunity to write a lot of narratives, write a lot of stories, and be what I like to call a raconteur. Uh, why? Because I just like saying rack on tour. And this has afforded me the luxury of being able to write for publications like CSO Online, Forbes, Huffington Post, and share stories from my time in the trenches and on occasion stuff that is current events of the day. As well, I founded roughly, well, eight, over 18 years ago, liquidmatrix.org, which started out very innocently, and I'll talk about that more later, but it has grown to the point where it can now legally vote. So now I work for Akamai Technologies as a global security advocate. What does that mean? It's a nice way to say evangelist because I don't want to say that. But I get to go around the world talking with customers about their problems, talking about things, giving talks at conferences. So I'm actually really enjoying myself at this point in my career. Now, the whole idea here is I want to talk about the storyteller as it applies to security. Now the storyteller is that it's something that is every one of us. Each one of us has a story to tell. We talk about battles that we've won against attackers and so on and so forth over pints. We'll go to the bar and we'll say, oh yeah, we blocked this guy or we broke into this system. We got rude on such and such. We do this all the time. Why? Because this is born out of history. This is something that started way back in the dawns of time, dawn of time. Dawns of time, unless you're doing you know, multiple timelines. Um, but we have moved from being nomadic peoples to moving through agrarian societies to major cities, and now we're off to the clown. And in so doing, we've learned along the way different ways of telling the stories. So when we started out as nomadic tribes, what we would do is we'd gather around the fire at the end of the day, we'd tell stories, the elders of the tribe would sit there and relay their events, and it would be passed down from generation to generation by oral tradition. At one point, there was no recorded medium to speak of. 
sure, cuneiform cave paintings. That was what they had at the time. And yes, I did learn how to do cave paintings in school. I am that old. Um, but as we went along, we learned new and better ways to do things. Along came the printing press. Came the, uh, you know, ultimately we get to the point now where we're at the internet. We're heavily interconnected. And there was a time where people started going, oh, well, everybody's on their mobile device, like these gentlemen in the front row, sorry to bust you. Um, and, <laughs> and we, we were, you know, you'd hear about, oh, we're all interconnected, we're not paying attention, we're really heads down, and this is nothing new. We have been doing this all along. This is the way we are. We are massive consumers of information, and that's one of the problems. We consume so much information, but we need to produce more. Not necessarily more for the sake of more. We have to do a better job of doing lessons learned, recording the things that we know, because I'm not going to be doing this forever. I've been working in this space in one way or another for about the last 25 years. If I'm doing this in another 25 years, I'll be like Jack Daniels and very grumpy. God love them. So more succinctly, we've gone from this sort of mentality to this sort of mentality, where we have, what was that video? Did anybody see the video about a thought leader? A bit, oh, okay. Google thought leader, and you'll see a very interesting TED talk about this. So I have used the globe a couple of times. But we are so heavily interconnected now. We have so much information, but we don't do a very good job of saving that information, storing it. But thankfully, there are organizations out there that are doing that on our behalf. The Internet Archive is a great example. They are collecting so much information from sites. Like, I was able to go back and find old versions of my own site from 2001. It goes back further than that, but that was the first time they started capturing it. And it's really interesting to see how things have progressed over time. We've gone from building websites to share our information amongst ourselves. We do this because it's simple. This is something we know. This is the lingua franca of the security community. We speak in web. And as we're doing this, and we're sharing this information, one thing that never occurred to me when I started doing this about 20 years ago was that one day these sites would not be available. So when I started writing with Liquid Matrix, there were so many times I would write an article and I would always link back to something I was talking about. When I went back recently and started going and looking at the old links that I connected to, so many of them don't work anymore. The sites are gone. The archives are gone. So if you're reading the article and says, oh, well, then check out this, it's now a dead link and the point is lost in many cases. And this is one of the problems that I see is we need to start doing a better job of archiving this information so that sites that look this cheesy um, would then ultimately become this cheesy. And as the sites grow up and they progress, we we'll want to find a better way to do storing information. So when with Liquid Matrix we used to write all kinds of articles, then we had kids. Then we stopped writing articles. So now, because we're old and lazy, we now do podcasts. So with the podcast, we now have archives that we can store and save. And with a not insignificant cost, we're able to actually archive these for the future use. So that people can actually go and listen to them and then go, wow, there's an hour of my life I'll never get back. And there's so many stories that we have to archive. A perfect example is the Morris worm. The Morris worm, when it was released in 1988, was a piece of code that went out and it caused damage, lots of damage. About 6,000 odd systems were compromised, or not compromised, but ruined as a result of this worm. The lesson to be learned here to take away was that there was a buffer overflow that we had to do a better job of protecting our systems as well as having some way to harden them, archive information so that we have backups and that we can move on from there so that if something bad happened, we could react. The Morris worm was a valuable lesson in that regard. Oh, sorry. But when you're looking at this, we all do, we've learned these lessons, right? We've gone forward and we've said, okay, Morris worm, we gotta do patching, we gotta do log review, we get, who am I kidding? Well, yeah, we, nobody likes doing this. Except maybe Dimitri McKay, but he's not here. Um, and, and that's just the thing. We have not really learned collectively the lesson of this, and this is something where we can improve. So there's an opportunity for us to do things better. And now we've moved into the cloud. I still love that Microsoft commercial where they go, to the cloud! Um, as silly and goofy as that might be, 
it's really interesting that so many people were resistant, and to this day are still, there are still outliers that really don't want to talk about cloud. But the practical matter is we're already there. We're already in the cloud. I know I'm preaching to the converted at this point, but there are folks out there that just don't understand that. And it's incumbent upon us to move forward and take this message to them and say, look, this is where the problems lie. This is where the things we have to be aware of. Now, when we go back in time and we look at from moving from nomadic into you know, early Greek society, one of the really interesting things that, at full disclosure, my actual degree is in classical studies and archaeology, so I had a great time working at Toys R Us. Um, <laughs> but one of the things I did learn is that in Greek theater, one of the mechanisms that they used was called the chorus. So if an actor was making a point or trying to deliver a message in the play that they were giving, in order to bring home that message, a chorus would echo back what had just transpired. Now think about that for a second. Somebody says something, chorus echoes back, hmm, sort of like the echo chamber that is the internet. But we just have to be aware that when we use this medium, excuse me, when we use this medium, that we do it in a positive fashion because there is so much that we can build upon here. And in those days, these were the heralds of old. So if they wanted to get the information out, there wasn't newspapers, there wasn't Twitter, there wasn't a Starbucks on the corner where you can go sit with your friends. These were how they, these were the mediums that they used to actually share their information. And one of the really interesting things is we should actually thank Greece for giving us the ability to have emphasis. Born out of a Greek word, a Greek mechanism from the plays. And we need to actually go forward doing a better job of making our point in a clear fashion. We need to grow up as an, or as an industry. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck doing the same thing over and over again. As I went through that stack of manuals in multiple organizations, same problems over and over again as I went through these books. Obviously, this happened before I had kids and I had free time, but that's a whole other ballgame. So, when we're going through, all, when I was going through all of these, I was looking at it, and I'm looking at it from the perspective of different narrative types. So when you're looking at it from the first person, you're looking at, oh, I did this, I did that, going through it, and it's like, okay, great, that's great for you, but how do you apply that beyond that? How do you take that and give it more credence to a wider audience? So the first person perspective is great for you, maybe a few other people, but you gotta be figure out how do you mold this into a narrative that works in a better way? So we can look at talking about things in the second person. Talking about you, you need to do this, you need to do that, this is how you can improve. Okay, that's fine. What about the third person? Third person, yes, well we have the ability to write he, she, they, all the rest. And I'm going through these different mechanisms because these are the different ways that we communicate today. And when we're doing this, we have to realize that there are mechanisms within these communication methods that we can leverage to make the point, one of which is the archetype of the clown. And the archetype of the clown is one that you can use to dramatically transform what you're trying to say. It gives you a deeper understanding because this character injects humor into the conversation. One of the things that I learned from a couple of uh, speakers that have been doing this way longer than I have is that when they talk about things and inject humor, they find that they get a lot more feedback from people afterwards asking questions. Why? Because the humor has resonated with them and it actually helped to get the message to take root. Rather interesting in that regard. And this is something that we see a lot of. The clown is not necessarily an idiot. The clown is actually a very effective member of an, a sorry, mechanism of any sort of writing or medium. This is generally a low character. It's usually a small character within you know, various types of literature. And it's used to actually nail home the fact that, you know, of a particular point, sort of a different variation on the chorus. It could be a talking monkey, a cricket, a meerkat, or a security evangelist. <laughs> and one of the problems that we have is that we become our own worst enemies. As security practitioners, and as security practitioners with access to the internet, we have an incredibly bad habit of getting upset about things and flying off the handle. Whatever that happens to be. I've been perfectly guilty of this. I have done really stupid things. 
Um, I'm trying very hard not to swear. Um, but as we're going forward and we understand that, you know, we get in the lather about things, rather than flying off the handle, we need to actually sit down and go, wait a minute, what was this person trying to say? A perfect example happened to me this week when I had an email from a coworker and I was foaming at the mouth, raging. I was so angry. I got up, I walked outside, I grabbed coffee, sat down, swearing up a storm. My wife gets home from wherever she was. She comes in, she goes, what's wrong? And I said, da 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 And she goes, are you sure that's what the email said? <laughs> you might have a point. I went back inside, read the email, and because I was pre-caffeinated, I read the email completely the opposite way of the way it should have read it, and I exploded. Luckily, I was had the I had the history of well knowing of when I get upset to walk away from something and then come back and check. Um, and luckily, my wife is far smarter than I am, so she was able to actually put some sage advice in there. And I realized that if I had gone off and I had made a huge deal about something. I could have just made myself one look like a fool or complicated issues or had it such that that particular coworker would never speak to me again. Nothing to be gained. And the problem is, is as we do these sort of things, as we fly off the handle, as I have done, we have to realize the world's watching us. As a security community, every time we do something in the public eye, people who are not us see us through a very different lens. And this is one of the things that we have to take into account. When we act like puerile teenagers, the world will treat us like puerile teenagers. Warning, thought leader. And this is one of the things is we see ourselves in a very different light. We see ourselves as the defenders on the wall. We are all dressed in black. We're having an isolated existence, living in a dark room with screens all around us. Not that they had electricity. <laughs> well, you take my meaning. This is one of those things where, as defenders on the wall, we have a certain mindset. Or, as red teamers, we have a different mindset. And the thing we have to realize is we are all part of the same collective. We're all dressed in black and horribly outgunned. Hmm, sounds awfully familiar. And we protect ourselves against the wildlings. We protect ourselves against the threat that is on the other side of the wall. We build our perimeter. We say, OK, this is our line. We have to protect it. And it's not always the right thing that we're protecting against. Sometimes we're looking in the wrong direction. Sometimes the threat can be very much behind us. I have worked in so many organizations where we've had incredibly ill-conceived things in our own network. And not all security is glamorous. As security practitioners, we have this innate fascination with red teamers. For example, Dr. Bear was saying earlier, it's like nobody loves the governance guy. Having done governance at one point in my career, he's right, nobody does. But that's an essential piece of the puzzle. Each individual in this room, whatever your role is in security, you are important to that collective. And we have to understand that, that red team, great, zero day, fantastic. What about the 100 day vulnerability? What about the Oracle patch from three quarters ago that has not been applied? Things that we have to take into account. So one of the really interesting things is in my career, I've had in those books, I have saved so many stories. One of the ones that really made me lose sleep was at an organiza organization that I worked at prior to where I am now. We had a database that had intellectual property on it. It was doing weekly backups. It would tar them up, ship them out. Nobody said boo to it. Then one day, my coworker and I were joking. It's like, hey, what do you want to bet that IP address is somewhere we'd, oh wait, where? Where's that going? We went and looked. IP address. Not in a country we do any business with. In a country that the media loves to put front, front row center saying, oh, these guys are evil. And in this particular case, it looks like they were right. When we looked at the log files, it turned out that this database had been backed up and shipped off to this nefarious third party for the better part of about eight years. <laughs> Cyber, exactly. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, this was APT, APT hipster. It was before it was cool. Um, and, th and this was one of the really frustrating things is nobody wanted to write it down. Nobody wanted to talk about it. 
And I'm like, wait, hold it, time out. We have to record this and save it as an archive and a lesson to put into our security awareness so that we don't have this happen again. Because this particular organization had a global flat network. And it was such that you had individual business groups that would set up their own databases and go live without any sort of gating process. So right there, we had a massive learning opportunity, and this was a flaming bag of nasty that we could use to say, look, this is what happens when you do it wrong. Now we'll take that and flip it over and say, look at the egress issues. Is this the one I want to talk about? Yes. This was another story where I was working for another organization where we had another global flat network, which seemed to be quite the in vogue thing. And with this particular organization, we had it set up so one country over in Asia had one of our facilities. And in this facility, I guess the folks there didn't really like what they were doing or they were really bored. So they actually set up a route around the firewall, build their own connection to the internet so they could download torrented films. And we didn't know about this because it wasn't even in our logs until RIA lawyers showed up. And we all know how wonderful, shiny, and happy they are. So they showed up and they caused us no end of headache. That was a real lesson learned because even though we had the firewall, we had the intrusion detection system and everything, they just routed around the whole thing physically. It was rather remarkable. Again, another opportunity for us to document and share this sort of information. And hopefully that has never occurred at that particular organization. Now when we're inside the echo chamber and something like this happens, our schadenfreude goes to 11. I'm guilty of this as well. When something goes wrong, somebody gets breached, MySpace, LinkedIn, Adobe, you name it, we go into a lather. It's like, oh my god, I can't believe they did that. At no point do we go, oh, we got the same configuration. Why? Because we do a terrible job of lessons learned. This is something where we could have actually taken the information from that, taken it out, and put it down and say, wait, okay, we learned this, this, and this happened, or the company won't talk because they're worried about getting sued by shareholders. Take out that information that we can get and say, apply it to your own organization. Is this something we can learn about? Is this something we can use to fix? <laughs> yeah, but you're a whole other ball game. We need to actually take a light and shine it on the, the, the various situations, we need to go forward and say, look, this is where the real problems are, and this is what we need to do to actually do a better job collectively. And we can do this. We just need to do a better job of it now. Because otherwise, we're going to get run over. Because there are folks out there that would absolutely love to do us harm. Law enforcement, governments, and I don't mean objectively this group of people, it's just they don't want us to have encryption. Back in <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to choke there. Back in 1991, Phil Zimmerman released PGP to the world for free, open source, boom, there you go. The US government tried very hard to prosecute him under the, I think it was the Export Control Act. Let me just double check. Yes, the, the Arms Export Control Act, they tried to prosecute him. This went on for three years. He spent time in a prison cell so that we could all have encryption today. Before that point, encryption was not something that was readily available to anyone. He did time so that we could actually, well not did time, he did some time, but he was incarcerated and went through the legal process to afford us that luxury that we have today. And we have to learn that lesson to take it forward because what's to say they won't come and take it from us again? We've had one round of crypto wars. It's not like governments right now are trying to dumb down encryption and take away our, well wait, here. <laughs> awkward. <laughs> Luckily for Phil, that case was dropped after three years. And much like Phil, we do need a champion. Now the champion doesn't have to be an overgrown Icelander, but as a collective voice, as all of us in this room and beyond here, we can actually take this information out of here and learn from it. Because we're faced with threats. One of the threats comes from within our own ranks, or tangentially, the charlatans. There are no shortage of folks that will hang out a signal <coughs> and say that they are security practitioners and this, that, and the other thing. And unfortunately, they'll get a voice. In the case of Gregory Evans, he actually got his mug in front of the cameras for CNN, MSNBC, and all others. People thought he was a bona fide expert. He did nothing to help our cause collectively. Because much like him and others, 
It just detracted from the story. But the really good thing about the universe is that it ultimately sorts people out. And in the end, you, want, you can only hope that the charlatans would get theirs. Cue the shock faced. We can't give up. We have to make sure that people understand that if security was easy, everybody would be doing it. It's like if you want a friend, get a dog. In security, same sort of thing applies. Security is not easy. It's a hard job. We have to understand, like, much like my friend Wendy Nather said, security is not all pen testers. 90% of the people out there that are doing security are non-glamorous, hard-working people. There are a lot of jobs out there. We focus on the wrong things. We need to focus on all of us. Embrace the suck. Embrace the suck, exactly. <laughs> and we can do that. Because until, people, until our enemies yield, they will keep coming. So what we have to do is we have to take the time to actually spend some time in other people's skin. Understand the other parts of a security practice. Rather than say, oh, they're compliance guys, the hell with these folks. I spent time doing that too. We have to understand that there's a real key piece of this that makes sense, that is there for a reason. In my own organization, our compliance team is one of the best I've ever seen. I've also worked in organizations with one of the worst I've ever seen. Their whole claim to fame at that time was a spreadsheet with 400 questions that they would give to vendors. That was about the sum total of their existence. Oddly enough, now working for a vendor, we have seen that exact same spreadsheet come in from a couple of people. But it's not all bad. There are people out there that do good things. And we have to realize that and embrace that. Embrace the suck, as you were saying earlier. And we need to support our, each other collectively. Because if we don't, we really are destined to make the same mistakes over and over again, no matter how noble our intentions might be. Because as we know, when Nicolas Cage shows up, things have gone sideways. <laughs> now, speaking of going sideways, when I worked at one particular company quite a, quite a few years ago, we were going around lifting floor tiles. Because this was back in the day when people would actually run cable and, you know, you have a suit on, you're like, okay, fine, get the cable, run it under the floor, nobody would ever say boo. Nowadays, I hear stories from friends that say, you know, 20-somethings come in and they're like, cable? Where's the gooey? So, this is one of those things where we had cable under the floor, we had to run it, we had lifting tiles, lifting tiles, get to the third tile in a row. I had done one, two, and then the third tile came up. What's under the floor? A Cisco 1750 staring back at me, blink, blink, blink. <laughs> Not the place you expect to find a Cisco router. This was really unfortunate. This Cisco router, turns out, had been there for seven years. The company that I was working for at, the point, at that point previously was part of a much larger company. And seven years earlier, it was split into five separate companies. At no point was this line outordered. At no point did anybody remember this was there because why? It wasn't documented. Nobody had actually recorded this anywhere. This was still live. We contacted the other company that it connected to. Thankfully, we had friends there. We talked it through. They didn't even know it was there. They found their end under the floor. <laughs> really boggles the mind. So when we look at these, when we look at these problems, we have to understand that the problems are not always going to come from where you expect them to come from. And each one of us has to actually contribute to make sure that these problems are solvable. See, if that was properly documented when they did the M&A work and they split the companies up, they would have actually said, oh, here it is. But there was no documentation to that effect. Admittedly, I don't like doing documentation, but it's necessary. So going back to one of the things I was talking about earlier with you know, the pen testers versus the governance folks, we really do have this weird fascination with the cult of personality. We really do tend to fixate on characters within our industry space. We're better than this. We really are. We should be fixating on all of us. This is our industry. We need to take this and make sure that we show that we are more mature than people like to write us off as. You look at doctors. You look at lawyers. They've got several hundred years start on us. We can catch up. We've done crazier things before. We don't want to have to go through and half-ass things. Because while the 
crown would suit you ill. Oh, damn, I crossed the memes. Um, we have to understand that the power of the message. And if we are all bickering amongst ourselves or doing silly things that we're fascinated on, oh, well, we downloaded this particular dump of passwords and then we're publishing, oh, here are the 10 worst passwords possible, that's the wrong message to send out because we sound like, you know, adult school children. If we're doing that sort of information, the wider audience, my parents are a perfect example. They look at this, they see this through a totally different lens. They're like, why are you shaming people? I went, that's a good point. You're looking at it entirely differently. What they should be doing is saying, here's how you do a better password. Or two-factor authentication. So there are ways to do this much better. And when you're giving your message, you want to make sure that you're really not sabotaging yourself. Now, case in point, this is from a, a, poten a potential Congress critter whose name absolutely escapes me. And of course, the slide looks like Munge. But he was, took a complete cut and paste from his own desktop and put it on to Twitter. The whole idea, he was trying to make some sort of point, but nobody remembers the point. Why? There's tabs open across the top. Oh. Yeah. It's probably totally fine. But that is exactly what everybody remembers. Nobody remembers the point he was trying to make. That nobody remembers that because he's trying to run for Congress. They remember this. And that's the same thing with us. It's like if we are trying to get a point across, we want to make sure that we're doing it in a good way. Because as we go through and we make our point, we want to make sure, one, we're doing it well, but two, we're doing it with emphasis so that through repetition, people will remember it. And we want to make sure that when we're doing this through repetition, that we're doing it in such a way that people take it away and say, oh, okay, this is much better. This is where we can improve. This is where we can move the ball forward. But these are the non-security people that are saying that at this point. Because you have to understand that if we don't share these lessons, you end up like Joffrey. Joffrey learned a very valuable lesson. For those of you who are not familiar with Game of Thrones, I apologize. But he learned very quickly that his food tester apparently was out that day. And it horribly for him. And unfortunately, the only lesson he can share with us is that by example. This is the mistake he made. He got to make it once. <laughs> We have to do things correctly. We break things by definition of who we are. Whenever I talk about something that is of a criminal bent, I talk about attackers, not hackers. Hackers are everybody in this room. An attacker has a criminal intent. We want to make sure that when we're having these conversations that we're actually clearly communicating these sort of things because the world has run us over in the interim. Example, there's a donut machine that was internet connected. You settle down. There's a donut machine that was internet connected. You're darn sure that somebody in this room would be going after it. <laughs> settle. <laughs> and the world will remember the wrong story. When we were trying to get through that there is a vulnerability in something that could potentially cause people harm through poison donuts, they don't see it that way. They see something uh, very differently. Now, as members of this community, we have to give back. When I started out, back when the world was flat, um, there was not a whole lot of information. There were tools that were available, but they were very limited. There was no such thing as a Masters of Information Security. I would have enjoyed that. It just didn't exist when I started. And now, there's so much out there that everybody has the opportunity to give back. How many people in this room use Nmap? Hence, there you go. How many people in this room use Metasploit? How many of you have contributed to either? Well, that's more than I expected. Thank you for that. And that's just it. We have to understand that you are a contributor. One of the really interesting things, and this happens more often than not, is I will meet somebody and they'll say, well, how did you get into blogging? Literally, I just started. I didn't think it through. I just found some articles and I shared them with folks at work. And they're like, oh, this is amazing. Where did you find this? Because this is back before Google was Google. Google existed, but very much in a uh, limited form. So I took these articles, and then I would share them on my own site with a little bit of commentary. So I was, I was a blogging hipster, God help me. Um, and this is the sort of thing where this information sharing started, and now we have a site with about 10-odd people that contribute because we can. 
It's an altruistic endeavor. There's no revenue to be had whatsoever. But we do it because we want to give back. We want to share our lessons learned, as well as give commentary on stories of the day. For example, if you hear about something, oh, I don't know, a dormant cyber pathogen on a cell phone? Sure, that's legit. And one of the things that, if you want to get into writing, you can't. There's nothing to limit anybody in this room. You can <laughs> Damn it. He's holding up a cyber pathogen's t-shirt. <laughs> a wise friend of mine once said that if you want to start writing and you don't know what to write about, start writing about anything. Now, I don't know if he's in this room, but you may recognize this guy. And he did this. He said, just start writing about anything. And one time I had a rather severe writer's block, and I did. I started writing about stairs. I started writing about the plant in my kitchen. And all of a sudden, it started coming. And I went, oh, OK, realize. And then I went, OK, well, I want to talk about this security idea, and then start. Folks like him are folks that give back, because he took the time to sit down with me and help me through that problem. And this is what we all need to do. And every one of us has the ability to do so. So the question is, are you up for that challenge? Are you up to contributing to the wider array? Because adversity is something we always have to contend with, but we need to collectively pull up our <coughs> shorts and get it done. You have to never forget to share the lessons. You have to realize that you're going to do things correctly. You have to give back to the community. <laughs> See where this is going? <laughs> you are a contributor. And you have to be up for the challenge. Because otherwise, we are going to repeat the same bloody mistakes we've always made. <laughs> and yeah, this is me driving. <laughs> you knuckleheads. No one likes being on fire. And we have to understand that we need to mature as part of our craft. We need to actually do a better job of being the adults at the table. It's perfectly within our purview. We can do this. So that is the challenge I put forward to you. There's nothing sadder than a clown on fire. That being said, I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to me today. I'm really happy that for the opportunity to be here to speak to you today. And I'm really excited for the rest of Circle CityCon. So that being said, thank you very much for your time.